This is Ruta Nuyokaite and you are listening to Lithuanian Dream Podcast, the most popular podcast about Lithuania in English. This Wednesday we are starting new tradition. So from now on you will be able to see our podcast episode video recordings here on social media. But don't worry, you can still listen to them as usual um, on any podcast uh, streaming platform like iTunes, Spotify and SoundCloud. So today we will talk about country branding and I think a lot of people, uh, especially now when Lithuania released its new uh, brand strategy that is called Co-Create, co um, thinking about the branding. So it's not just Lithuanians branding. Uh, for most of us, uh, we get associations or even slogans that come into our minds when we think about certain countries. For instance, Germany is praised for stability and good cars. Italy for a good quality food products and the US as a land of opportunity. For the small countries like Lithuania that regained its independence 30 years ago, recognition is usually important. The economy for sure can benefit from a good marketing, so we attract more tourists, foreign investors and workers. To answer the question how country branding can improve, can be improved, uh, we invited one of the best experts in the world, Simon Anholt. He is the founder and publisher at the Good Country Index. In his career, he has consulted more than 50 countries. His TED talk uh, named Which Country Does the Most Good in the World? has got over 10 million views. Simon has written six books about countries, their images and their role in the world. Today, we will talk about his most recent book, The Good Country Equation, how we can repair the world in one generation. Hello, Simon. Thank you for joining us today. Hi. So, I just read your new book, uh, The Good Country Equation. Amazing work. I recommend it to everyone. Um, it's amazing to see how many countries you worked with. Um, and I was wondering, uh, which countries are still on your list? You mean the ones that I want to work for and I haven't worked for yet? Oh, there's a lot left. I mean, last time I checked, um, there were about uh, 203 countries on the planet. And I think I've probably worked for maybe 60 of them. Um, I can't do maths, but that leaves quite a lot still. <laughs> um, and, and by definition, I would like to, to, to work with all of them. All countries are interesting to me. Uh, in fact, the more remote, uh, obscure, uh, small, marginal they are, the more interesting I find them. So as a quick uh, sort of summary of your work, uh, you started working, you are from the UK, mm. uh, but then you started working with the, uh, other countries from across the European region, and then you consulted countries across uh, South America, then um, Asia. Uh, which countries were the most interesting for you? In your book, actually, there are quite a few examples and the chapters uh, comparing them. Mm. But which ones would you uh, highlight as the most interesting and sort of breaking points for you as a, as a person working with, uh, you know, branding of countries? Um, well, first of all, I have to say that I hate that word branding. Um, and I'm sure we're going to talk about that a little bit later on. Um, but I wanted to raise it the very first time you said it. Um, I really have a problem with that idea of branding countries. Um, but we'll talk about that in a minute. To try and answer your question, I, I, I know this is such a boring answer to your question, but they're all interesting. I mean, I, you know, if you asked me the opposite question and said which one was the least interesting country, I would find that just as difficult to answer because they're all fascinating. I, I just love countries um, and they're all fascinating in their in their own way. I mean, as you can see from the book, um, in some countries I had more um, weird 
crazy, ridiculous experiences than in others. And I wanted to write the book as a sort of personal adventure story, uh, just to make it more fun to read so it isn't a kind of textbook. Um, and so I tended to concentrate on the countries where either I learned the most uh, or the weirdest things happened, uh, just to make it more entertaining for the reader. So the the I don't know how many countries I included in the book, um, maybe 10 or 12. Those were the ones that where I learned the most interesting lessons on the whole or where the strangest things happened. Um, but that doesn't mean the other countries where I worked were any less interesting. They just didn't fit the scheme of the book quite so well. I really liked uh, your observation that small countries or countries that are new to international community tend to take advice uh, more thoroughly than more established countries. Uh, why do you think it is so? And uh, because I think every country and person who works for the country wants to have the best quality of work and, you know, execute it well. Well, the trouble with um, rich posh, large, powerful, successful countries is that they have a recipe that they don't want to change. Um, and the thing that they value most is stability. So when they uh, get advice from somebody like me, um, it's usually because they want to say that they've listened to the advice and they've decided to ignore it, right? So it's a kind of safety mechanism. So they can say, yeah, we had this guy and he told us some interesting things and we decided that they were interesting, but we weren't going to pursue them. And then they can say, we've done that. We asked the question. We, we did what we needed to do. Smaller, weaker, developing countries, they have a much bigger challenge ahead of them. They need to grow. They need to extend their influence or their engagement with the international community. So they're much more likely to take my advice. And that's why I find it on the whole more rewarding working with countries like that, because they have something to prove. Yes, but then it's a struggle, a bit of a struggle to find your place in international community. And you talk about it as well in your book, uh, that every country should be useful for international community. It's not just talking about yourself, how great are your achievements. Uh, I don't know, Georgia says that the, the wine came from, from, from this country and they're very proud of Lithuanians as well, very proud of being the last pagan country. So, you know, very yeah. all these things. So... What about finding a role in community of countries? Uh, how can country find it? Uh, are there any left, uh, especially for the small countries? Oh, gosh, there's so many. Because what, what all of my research shows <clears throat> is that people like countries because they think those countries are a positive presence, right? <clears throat> Sorry, it's winter. It's a bad time to do interviews. Um, so... The, the countries that people like most are the countries that seem to contribute most to the world that we live in, right? So I feel glad that Lithuania exists. This is the kind of response that one is looking for. Why would I feel glad that Lithuania exists? Not because it's happy or beautiful or successful, because that doesn't benefit me unless I live in Lithuania. It only benefits Lithuanians, so I'm not interested. I'm interested in what Lithuania does for the world that I live in and my children and my grandchildren are going to live in. And so it's really very easy in principle, um, the way that a country can stand out. All it has to do is to write a list of all of the biggest challenges in the world, right? What keeps me awake at night? What does everybody in the world worry about? Climate change, pandemics, migration, terrorism, human rights abuses, education, nuclear proliferation, violence, fundamentalism. We're lucky, you know, uh, Ruta, because we live in an age where there are so many challenges to choose from. It's like we're spoiled. Um, you, you, you have 30 or 40 major challenges facing humanity at the moment and hundreds more smaller ones. So for any country to say, we want to focus on trying to do something about this problem, it's so easy. There are too many to choose from. It's, a, it's a, a luxury, really, at this point in history. So we should be so grateful that we live in such a difficult time because there are so many challenges that we can choose and make our own and commit ourselves to. And that's how you earn a reputation. That's how you become a country that matters, by doing something. And 
the other thing to say is, of course, I'm not suggesting that countries have to fix these problems on their own, right? If you make a list of 30 grand challenges like climate change, of course, it's easy for a smaller country to look at that and say, yeah, but what could we do, right? We have a small economy, we have a small population, we have a small uh, land area, um, we, we have limited influence. But of course, you don't need to do it on your own. That's ridiculous. You know, the idea that Lithuania is going to fix climate change, it's ridiculous. The only way we're going to fix any of these challenges is by countries cooperating and collaborating by working together. So the question is not com what can we do on our own? The question is, what can we do if we work with other countries? And you can just ring up the government of, of Eswatini or Guatemala or Greenland and say, hey, would you like to work with us on um, landmines or small arms proliferation or the next coronavirus? And they'll say yes, of course they'll say yes. And that doesn't diminish the profile that you earn because you're doing it together with other countries. It increases the profile. It makes it more interesting. It makes a better story. So it, it's really, really nothing to do with how powerful you are as a country. This is the age for less powerful countries to have powerful impact. It's very, very amazing that actually countries can uh, do good in the world. And at the same time, when we do good, we bring trust in the community for ourselves. So this is an amazing tool uh, to have. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, countries really emphasize economic development as one of the main drivers of, of sure. you know, their wealth. And sometimes doing good goes against uh, against that economic development. Mm. So I don't know, saying something about Taiwan might affect the relationship with China, the sure. same with Turkey. And uh, yeah, how do you think should small countries take big challenges? Uh, because, you know, the economy is still going to be one of the most important uh, things for them, too. Um, in some instances, um, to do the right thing for the global community will create a disadvantage for you domestically, but not in every case. And I guess this is my main point. It's remarkable when you speak to governments, how many of them assume that anything you do for the international community is going to disadvantage, disadvantage you domestically, right? So anything, anything I do for the environment, for the global environment, is going to slow my economy. Anything I do that benefits my own population is going to harm somebody else in some other part of the world. And so governments are so fixated with this idea, so obsessed that their national interest is incompatible with the global interest that they don't even try. They don't even look, they just say, nah, we, we have to focus on our own country because our own country's needs are paramount. And this is disastrous in so many ways. Sometimes it's true, of course, um, that, that your domestic interests are in contrast to global interests, but by no means always. In fact, in the majority of cases, you can find a way of achieving really, really interesting compromises between your domestic needs and your international needs. So the one thing I'm not doing is suggesting that countries sacrifice themselves for the global good, that they become kind of charitable donors, that they give away money that they can't afford to poor countries. This is not what I'm talking about at all. What I'm talking about is trying to find innovative new ways of harmonizing your domestic and your international responsibilities. And this opens a whole new world of policy making, which most governments have never even dreamed of. When you, when you start looking at domestic challenges in an international context and in an international perspective, and working together with other players in other parts of the world, you find that suddenly your horizons expand and there are many, many more opportunities for, to do good governance, both domestically and internationally at the same time. So I guess my, one of the most important messages of the book is that those two things um, are not hostile to each other. You can do good at home while you do good abroad. That is what I call the gold standard of good governance in the 21st century. 
Yes, and it's amazing that you used um, that you talked about uh, env environmental change because this is one of the biggest challenges now we are facing. Um, and some of the collective um, action tools or unions, so European Union and UN, do have uh, goals like sustainable goals, and then we have a Green Deal in the EU. And these things, both EU and UN, and separate programs made to help uh, fight uh, challenges. Mm -hmm. And uh, why do you think we need uh, countries as well, individual countries, to undertake these challenges and become sort of a change makers? Are, are these not institutions not enough? Well, plainly, they're not enough. Um, I mean, if every time there's a... Um, uh, there's a there's a need a necessity for the international community to work together in order to achieve something to combat the pandemic uh, to combat climate change to deal effectively with mass migration it fails the performance of the international community is invariably disappointing i mean in some areas of course it's great the um, medical and technical cooperation between countries is almost always good. If you go to uh, a, a field like academia, for example, international cooperation and collaboration is wonderful. It's a model for how the whole world should work, which is why just a few months after the arrival of this new uh, strain of a, of a dangerous virus, we have a vaccine that's actually in people's arms. So that shows that in certain areas we are very effective at massive international collaboration. But when it comes to governance uh, and, and most other areas, almost all the areas apart from the scientific and the economic, um, we fail. And that's why I think it's necessary for us to be, for all countries to be constantly trying new ways of working together in addition to the traditional forms. So what the European Union does is great. What the United Nations does is great. Those provide us with useful templates, but it's not nearly enough. One of the uh, other main messages of the book is that um, the traditional culture of governance has to change. Up until now, the culture of governance has been fundamentally competitive. It's basically about how can I, as a country, um, achieve an advantage or an ascendancy or power over other countries. We will not survive unless we can change that culture to one that's fundamentally collaborative. So first, how do we work together? First, how do we preserve our collective environment and our collective peace and prosperity? Then you can compete on top of that. At the moment, it's the wrong way around. First, we compete, then we collaborate. We need to do the other way around. We need to first collaborate and then compete. And we know that this works because there are enough examples to show that it can work. This is the way that industry has been behaving since the 1970s. It's just an experiment that governments uh, should, be, uh, should be trying immediately, and they don't. Yes, and the business actually working in that kind of way. If there's no monopoly, then the businesses need to cooperate and partner with, with each other to achieve goals. Right. And I guess this is the solution democratic societies took and EU took uh, in order to create a um, peaceful Europe after so many years of fighting and wars. However, there is China that is growing economical power and it is seen as a, a country that do not represent some of the values uh, that EU and the rest of the Western world represent. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, what do you think will happen and can we um, make agreement uh, with the developing world and say uh, you know, that we would like to have this world together, not just impose our own rules, but do it together? Yeah, I mean, the reality of the matter is that um, even with China, um, the international community does cooperate and does collaborate in many, many areas. It's not ideal. It's insufficient. And of course, the, um, the cultural differences, uh, the ideological differences are a challenge, but they are a fascinating challenge. I mean, imagine how boring the world would be if every country on earth believed in, um, in the same principles, the same structures of government, had the same background, the same culture, the same history, the same religion. It wouldn't be so interesting. It wouldn't be so productive. So I always believe that even when 
<clears throat> you have fundamental differences of approach, that is the opportunity to create better and more interesting solutions. I mean, sure, if it were possible to treat the world as if it were a, a marketplace and break down the monopolies by law um, and look at China and say, you know, that's like um, uh, that's like Microsoft. It's too big. Um, it's uh, potentially a monopolist. So uh, so so we need to dismantle it um, and split it up into five smaller countries. It would make things a lot easier if we could do that. But you can't do that. And so you have to work with what you've got. Um, I, I think there's every hope that we can. I don't think it will ever be easy. I don't think it'll ever be entirely peaceful, but I think it'll always be productive as long as we go into these negotiations with an open mind and an open heart. I, I hope it. Um, I hope that too. And I think, yeah, China and Chinese, they want to be part of the international community. And I would, you know, uh, I hope it will be not in the way that is uh, predicted by some of the journalists and mm -hmm. academics, but it will be the co cooperative world. Yeah, uh, but there's something to, there's something to to add there, if I may. Um, you, you you mentioned earlier, I think, in your last question, also about the economic factors that this idea of collaboration often runs counter to countries' economic interests. Um, I have to remind you here that one of the key points of the book is that it proves that it's actually not against countries' economic interests. Because the one thing I'm not saying is that rich countries should help poor countries by giving them money. This is a very, very old-fashioned idea, which is sometimes useful, sometimes even necessary, but it's not really what I'm talking about. Um, if countries wait until they are rich enough to think about the rest of the world, then we're lost, okay? Because no country ever thinks it's rich enough to worry about the rest of the world. This is not about being rich enough to be able to help other countries. All countries at every stage of development can work together with other countries to everybody's uh, benefit. I'm not talking about charity. I'm not talking about altruism. I'm talking about the benefits of mutual engagement. So the fact that Kenya, for example, managed to come in the top 30 of the first edition of the Good Country Index was a really important proof of this concept, that it's not about how much money you give to poorer countries. That's not what a good country is about. It can be part of it, but it's not the main thing. The main thing is how effectively and completely you engage with the international community. And it is in your economic interest to do so for the simple reason where we started. People admire good countries. So as long as China, for example, um, continues to uh, treat some of its own population uh, badly to abuse human rights, it will never be a fully admired country. People around the world will never fully trust it or like it. And that has a direct impact on its ability to grow economically because it constrains China's ability to trade with the rest of the world. If people like you and they approve of you, they're much more likely to invest in your economy, to buy your products, to visit your country on vacation, to hire your people, to want to live and work in your country. So good countries get more business. Countries that are unpopular or mistrusted or not well understood will always find that that acts as a break on their economic development. So it is directly in the economic interest of countries to engage and contribute more to the international community. There's no question about this. China does well without engaging as much as it could because it's a very large country with a very large economy, but there's still a, there's still a constraint on it. It's still constrained by the fact that uh, most people around the world don't trust it as a power broker. And it's going to have to come to terms with that sooner or later. Um, yes, um, and the diversity that is very important uh, for you, you use that in not just uh, talking about international community, but you, you use it when you do the strategy for the country. Mm. Could you tell us more about the process of working with the country and what kind of um, checklist do you have? Mm. Well, um, w when I when I work with governments, um, it's uh, it's always very important uh, to try to involve as many representatives of different parts of the country as you possibly can. Um, there are several reasons for that. The first one is that I'm more or less completely ignorant about most other countries. I mean, I do my best to learn about them. And of course, uh, if a government asks me to advise them, then I'm going to spend 
uh, two or three months reading every single book I can find on that on that country and watching all the movies and listening to the music and reading the poetry and and all the rest of it. But in the end, I cannot be an expert on that country. So I rely very much on the people I'm working with in that country to provide the knowledge and the expertise of their own country to the conversation we're having. And that's why it's super important that it's not just the president or the prime minister. Um, it's the whole of government, but it's also representatives of civil society, of the population as a whole, um, of academia, sport, young people, schools, entrepreneurs, uh, farmers, trade unionists, as many people as you can possibly bring together to talk about that country and its role in the world. And that sounds very complicated, but in the end, what we're doing is very simple. We're just trying to answer some really important questions. And I suppose the most important question of all is, what is your country for? Why does it exist? You know, just to say to look after our own people is not really an answer. That's just a circular uh, debate. We exist because we have a number of people and we look after those people in order to exist. And so we exist by looking after those people. That's not a good reason to exist. You have to do something to merit, to earn your place uh, in the international community and the hectares of the Earth's surface that you occupy. And so I think every country needs a sense of purpose. It needs to say, um, you know, if, uh, if, if the hand of God accidentally slipped on the celestial keyboard at 3 a.m. and hit delete and removed Lithuania or wherever it is off the face of the earth, who would miss it and why? You know, how do we deserve our, our, our privileged position of being a sovereign nation uh, in, on planet earth? And that's the question you need to ask. Why should somebody in another country on the other side of the earth feel glad that we exist? What have we done for them? Not what have we done for ourselves, because that's obvious. If you're a half decent country with a half decent country, uh, government, you provide benefits to your own population. But what about the rest of the 8 billion people who share this planet? What have you done for them? Have you made their world more stable, more peaceful, more prosperous, more beautiful, more calm? And if not, do you deserve to exist? I don't think you do. Um, yes, uh, and the hand of God made mm. some countries really good at it. And um, we know about some of the countries more than others. And it is partially uh, due to good branding, the word you don't like, or another great word, propaganda. <laughs> and in your book, you say uh, that if uh, propaganda worked so well and the countries could convince everyone that they know the, you know, the golden model of how to be a great country or how to run your economy, mm -hmm. then we would have lived now in communism or Nazism. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, where is the line between uh, these two things, the soft power mm -hmm. and the propaganda? Um, okay. First of all, I have never seen any evidence that it's possible to improve the image or the profile of a country by communication. I've never seen any evidence of it. I've been measuring the images of countries for, for, for nearly 20 years, and there is zero correlation between the amount of money that countries spend on promotion and branding and the quality of their image. And I think there's a very obvious reason for that. It's because no matter how much money you spend telling everybody how wonderful your country is, they're not really very interested. If you're selling them a product, right? And you're saying, come to my country because we have beautiful beaches and you can have a wonderful holiday there, then that's different. If you spend a lot of money on tourism promotion, you will, your tourism industry will benefit. You will get more tourists. That's pretty simple. But to try to change the image of your country by saying to everybody, look at how wonderful my country is, it very evidently doesn't work, which is why I refer to Nazism. I mean, almost nobody in history has understood branding on a big, on the state scale, um, as well as uh, Joseph Goebbels did. And yet, when uh, the Nazi party tried to brand Nazi Germany to the rest of the world, they failed. Nobody bought that story at all. Um, Kim Jong-un and his uh, father and grandfather before him have tried to brand North Korea as a desirable state, and people laugh at them. It works in Korea, it works in Germany, because you control all the information reaching your citizens. 
they only hear one story. And if you only hear one story, eventually people will believe it. Unfortunately, this is what's been happening in Trump's America. People only hear one story because they voluntarily submit to the propaganda. They voluntarily close off their minds to the alternative stories. So what we have in America today is something not all that different to what's going on in North Korea. The only difference is that the poor North Koreans have no choice. The Americans choose to listen to only one version of the story. And so they voluntarily propagandize themselves and they only believe that one story. But that's propaganda. And most of the time when countries try to do so-called nation branding, they're trying to do propaganda. They're spending a lot of money, sometimes outrageous amounts of money, sending out messages saying, look how wonderful we are. Nobody listens. Nobody believes them. Nobody cares. It's a waste of money. It doesn't work because people don't care. It doesn't benefit them. If, um, you know, if, if uh, um, South Africa spends $100 million a year telling me how wonderful life is in South Africa, I'm not interested because I don't benefit from that. I don't live in South Africa. I don't care. The message is of no interest to me whatsoever. But if I read in the newspaper that South Africa is working hard to combat migration or climate change or something of that sort, then I like South Africa because South Africa is doing something for me. And that's what matters. So it's not what you say about yourself to make yourself famous. It's what you do to make yourself relevant. That's the trick. Very briefly, I'm also not very keen on the term soft power. Um, I am a great admirer of Professor Joseph Nye, who coined the phrase. I think his work makes a huge amount of sense and has been a huge contribution to the debate. But in the end, soft power is still power. It's still based on a construct which says the name of the game is country A achieving ascendancy over country B. It's about beating the others. And I think that uh, idea, the idea that you need to find ways of achieving power over other countries is the thing that we need to challenge. Of course, soft power is better than hard power. Of course, it's better to try and hit people with your culture or your folk songs uh, than to try and hit them with uh, bullets and bombs, of course. But you shouldn't be thinking about hitting them at all. You shouldn't be thinking about achieving power. We all inhabit one earth and we're all in this boat together. So if we're constantly trying to have winners and losers, then we're all losers. People need to understand that life on earth is a team sport. It's not a race. And as long as there are countries uh, trying to achieve ascendancy over each other in every way, America first, Germany first, Lithuania first, Japan first, then we all lose. Everybody comes last. Yes, and um, it's amazing to see what's happening in US. And as you say, people voluntarily uh, read propaganda or they actually uh, sign themselves um, to the newsletter list. And they watch, I don't know, Facebook videos and all these things that end up being our reality. And this question uh, is very, very close to me because I think about it quite a lot because I work in marketing and I see that the brightest minds of uh, our century around me, marketeers, are the people who are basically working every day to know how to make people click the button and the conversion rate should be bigger. So people sit around the tables and think how to increase the conversion rate instead of like solving big problems. And there are a lot of people working in this field. Um, and I remember a great Canadian psychologist, uh, Steven Pinker, and his ideas about uh, the fact that now we think that the world is more violent However, the world is not violent now, but we have uh, better access to the information. So the access to the information is very important because this is how we know what is happening in the world. But at the same time, joining these two ideas about marketeers and the access to the information, it means that the, the power nowadays is in the hands of a person who has the information, so the information channel. And the technology hugely changed our lives in a good way, but at the same time, even if you do good nowadays, you need to have very good PR and access to the people who translate these, these messages to the world. Otherwise, nobody will know, or do you think they would? 
Um, I agree with everything you just said, and I think it's I think it's very insightful. The only thing that I'm not sure about is whether um, it's absolutely necessary to have a lot of money to spend on public relations in order to promote your story, because we're talking about countries again now. Let's let's leave companies. Let's leave the private sector, because in so many ways, those two things are not really um, useful comparisons. Over and over again, I've seen how the countries that um, genuinely do the most to make themselves relevant to other people and do it with a certain amount of imagination, a certain amount of flair, are the ones that get noticed. I always think that if uh, one of the things I often say to governments is, if you find yourself needing to spend money on public relations in order to push your story out, it probably means that you failed. It means that your story is just not interesting. Because if you have to bribe the media to carry your story, then that means that the media is not interested in your story. And if the media is not interested in your story, then the audience won't be interested either. It probably just means you've got a boring story. Why do PR agencies exist? Well, they do a lot of useful strategic work and stuff like that, but fundamentally they exist in order to force the media to carry boring stories that the media knows its own audience doesn't want. But if you pay them, they'll run the story even if it's boring. So one of the thing, one of the problems that countries face is that governments are inherently boring. They need to be boring in some ways because they're dealing with the lives and livelihoods of millions of people every day. They need to be very serious and being terribly imaginative is often quite a risky thing to be. And so governments, even when they come up with good policies, those policies are usually very boring and nobody's interested in them. So nobody finds out about them, even domestically, let alone internationally. So one of the things I often say to countries is it's not enough just to do things that are useful, that harmonize your domestic and your international uh, responsibilities, as I said before. Those things also have to be magical. Not all of them, just some of them. So once in a while, one in every 10 policies that you introduce has got to have something extraordinary about it, something magical, something creative. When I use the word creative, I simply mean the opposite of boring, okay? So instead of always trying to do the things that make sense on paper and that are reassuring because some other country has already done them once before, try and do something totally amazing that really connects with people. And I've seen so much evidence during my career that if you really do that, if the work that you're conducting as a country really does connect to people in their lives, it really is relevant, it really is powerful, it really is sincere, and it really is magical, then you don't need to spend one single cent on PR in order to promote it. People will be grabbing that story from you instead of you trying to force the story onto them. I mean, one of the best examples of that is probably Bhutan, one of the smallest, economically weakest countries on the planet. And yet it became world famous because of a simple idea called gross national happiness. The idea that this tiny country with a tiny economy measured prosperity on the basis of people's happiness rather than on the basis of GDP was absolutely revolutionary. And it made that country famous. There are now, I've, I've lost count of how many surveys there are now measuring happiness. Every single politician around the world, sooner or later, stands on a stage and says, uh, don't judge me by how much money we make as a country, judge me by how happy we are at the end of it. All of this came from Bhutan, one of the smallest, poorest countries on earth. And they did not spend a fortune on public relations to push this idea of gross national happiness because it wasn't a brand that they were trying to sell. It was the way that they saw the world, and it was a message that had meaning and relevance and value to other people around the world. Bhutan showed that it understood something that America and the West didn't understand, which was about fundamental values in society. So if you do something that really connects to people, you don't need to spend money on marketing it. But I guess Bhutan really understood what people nowadays are looking for. The people in the West as well, the happiness and uh, the Happiness Institute in Copenhagen. I just yeah. read the Hugo book. Uh, more than one million copies sold. Yeah. Um, because, you know, when people have the basic economic standard, 
then they they start thinking about other needs and one of them is the the fulfillment um and yeah it's amazing um and it's amazing that they decided uh, not to let that many tourists in because mm. tourists leave the trays behind them yeah. uh, and influence the culture yeah. uh, like we have seen in tibet in ladakh after uh, the road was built and then mm. the 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 western values arrived and the the goods and the capitalism that ruined the society in a sense so um yeah and uh, another question that is very very close to my heart is uh, the regional affiliations so you write in your book that uh, regional affiliation can help countries that not that well known in some mm. cases like scandinavia mm. it is a good region so uh, we would say norway finland uh, denmark sweden they all sort of similar mm. but at the same time this cultural affiliation can work not in a good way for countries mm. that are not well known like mm. eastern europe uh, all the ex soviet union countries 15 mm. countries are called eastern europe mm -hmm. and if we first we can say there's no stereotype it's fine but then if we read uh, a newspaper article and somebody says a woman from scandinavia did something or a woman from eastern europe did something or a man uh, there would be a completely different image we would have in our heads so we all have bias uh, the question is, how do we fight this bias and do we need this, uh, these uh, affiliations to the regions or should we break them and how countries can break out of the affiliations of Eastern Europe, of African country, of, uh, I don't know, developing world country? It's, it's a big challenge. Um, humanity has a terrible habit of uh, generalizing uh, when it should particularize. And I make the same point when I'm talking about uh, racism and intolerance. The real problem of racism and intolerance is not so much that it comes from ignorance, but that it comes from laziness. It's so much easy, easier for me uh, to judge you because of the group that you come from than it is for me to take the trouble to find out about you as an individual. And this is the problem. In the same way, people judge countries on the basis of their geographical region. Uh, because it's too much trouble to find out what they are. I mean, Lithuania, what the hell? It's a Baltic state, right? So I consider it as a Baltic state. That's so much easier. That saved me 75% of work. Um, because if I didn't do that, I'd have to try and figure out how it's different from Latvia and how it's different from Estonia. And that's much more work. And most people, most of the time, don't bother. It's the same with people. So it's very, very hard to fight against that because it's a very natural, you might say, an evolutionary response uh, for humanity to save itself time and effort. The problem is it gets you into all kinds of trouble. And uh, I think that the solution to this problem, it, I don't think it is something that individuals, countries, individual countries can really fight against because you can't, Lithuania can't fight human nature. Sure, up to an extent, if you work very, very hard to make yourself relevant and important to the human community, then that's very valuable because then people will say, oh, okay, there's the Baltic states and there's Lithuania. And that will help to teach people that there's a bit of a difference going on there. You can see that already with Sweden. Uh, when you ask people around the world to talk to you about the Nordic region, um, they tend to put Sweden in a slightly different category simply because Sweden is the most powerful economy. It tends to be the most prominent of the Scandinavian countries. It tends to be the one that people know about because they know about Ikea, they know about ABBA, they know about um, Volvo. Uh, there are lots of famous Swedes. The Swedes, as I often say, are the Americans of Europe. They're very good at pushing themselves forwards and promoting themselves. The, the, the Danes and the Norwegians and the other uh, Nordic neighbors tend to be much more modest and they don't push themselves so hard. So Sweden demonstrates that it is possible for a country within a region to stand out a little bit if it really, really wants to. In the same way, um, what we in the West call the Middle East, West Asia, uh, the Arab world, for example, you have, um, uh, for example, um, Dubai, a city which stands out from that region quite noticeably and has different attributes in people's minds from their generic view of the Middle East. Um, so it is possible to do that. But in the end, 
the fundamental problem here is one of human nature and the way that human beings look at things and perceive things. And the only cure to problems of human nature is education. So uh, that's why a really important part of, of the good country equation uh, is this notion that we also need to try, we, we have to fix the world, but we also have to fix humanity. And the only way that we can fix humanity is by taking one generation to do it via education. And one of the things that we need to teach the next generation of children all over the world is the art of particularizing instead of generalizing. So what is the what is that art of particularizing? I think it's um, first of all, you have to take pleasure in it. So if we're talking, for example, about different types of human being, if you're not very interested in other people, other cultures, other races, then you're probably never going to bother to particularize. You're just going to put people in, in boxes and say, that's a box of Africans, that's a box of North Americans, that's a box of Europeans. So the first thing is I think you have to teach uh, children at quite a young age to understand the magic of diversity. And I don't use diversity in the politically correct sense of the word. I mean, in the genuine true sense of the word, the fact that humanity is all very, very different. And that's what makes humanity interesting. All those histories, all those cultures, all those different costumes, religions, different skin colors, different eye color, different hair color. I mean, that's what's fascinating about the human race. And I think that if we draw children's attention to the magic and the beauty of diversity at a very early age, and we teach them about cultural difference, we teach them anthropology, for example. Anthropology is a, is a wonderful subject for, for, for six or seven year olds if you teach it in the right way. Then they start to take a scientific pride in understanding and appreciating and like a connoisseur the cultural differences within the human species. And then it's impossible for them to, 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 in, to generalize because their scientific pride won't allow them to. That's, that's lazy thinking and they won't, they won't permit it. I think this is one of the problems with political correctness that it tends to think that the solution to the problem of racism and intolerance is to make cultural differences taboo, not to talk about them. So don't call this person black because you might offend them. This is such an insane idea, I hardly know where to start. Why would, why would a black person be offended that you acknowledge that they're black? It's really confused thinking. It sort of uh, is a little bit like treating uh, racial or cultural diversity as if it were a disability. Don't talk about the fact that this person uh, it, it has got a disability because you might offend them. You must talk about it. The, the most basic, basic element in human nature is curiosity. We have to acknowledge and celebrate that people are curious about difference. What, what, does it, what does it feel like to have a white skin or a dark skin? What is your experience of the world? How is it different from mine? What does it feel like uh, to speak um, Hossa instead of uh, Latvian? What does that feel like? What does it feel like to grow up uh, in the Southern Hemisphere instead of the Northern Hemisphere? This is the most magical thing about being a human being on the, in the world that we live in. So we need to stimulate that sense of magic. Otherwise, we'll never reach our goal, which is getting people to appreciate diversity instead of running away from it. Yes, and uh, diversity, yeah, it's very important. But at the same time, uh, the trust is among the people who are similar to each other. And by seeing different, we sort of affiliate uh, to our own group, yeah. in a sense. Um, and it's very interesting that uh, these trends or our society is developing in a way that, uh, I don't know, in 20th century, uh, women got the right to vote. Great. Mm -hmm. And now I was born, uh, whatever, years later. And then, you know, I, my generation, we don't even think about it as a thing that happened or was not given. Mm -hmm. uh, the same with the racism. Struggle happened in 70s, 80s, 90s. Now it is given that we are not racist to each other. Uh, the same with LGBTQ rights. Now mm. the struggle is happening. So there are trends or things that we say, this is not right anymore, and this is a human mm. right, and we should be equal. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, um, in movies, the stereotypes are changing as well. 
And uh, still we see that some countries are being looked at differently in the movie's language. And mm. I don't know, the Borat is a good example when yeah. you can laugh about Kazakhstan and it's completely mm. okay. But now we, you don't make uh, evil Chinese movies or Russian mm. movies mm. or American movies mm. because these power uh, countries hold the power or why we don't make these kind of movies anymore. Mm. Um, <laughs> there, there are two... Um... There are two possible interpretations here, aren't there? One of them is the interpretation of progress, um, that it'll take a little while. Um, we don't make fun of people. Well, we, we in, in civilized Europe don't make fun of other people because of the color of their skin anymore. We still think it's okay to make fun of people because they come from a country we don't know very much about. But the progress model says that eventually somebody will wake up to that. And I believe that. I believe that in a few years' time, um, people will look at a movie like Borat and say, my God, that is so dated. I can't believe that people were laughing at that. In the same way that today you look back on comedy shows from the 1970s and see white people um, uh, made up as if they were black people and everybody laughing at it. Okay, So I think that's just progress, right? We no longer uh, we no longer make fun of people from the most vocal uh, ethnic minorities, but we still make fun of people who don't complain. Eventually, we won't make fun of anybody, right? And that I think is progress. We'll have to find other ways to make ourselves laugh. Laugh. I'm sure we will manage because we're good at finding uh, humor in in everyday life. We just need to find ways of being humorous that are not at the expense of other people. The other way of looking at it is that it which you implied there is that it's just a question of shifting power and racism will always exist according to that um, interpretation um, it will simply take advantage of whoever has least power at any given moment and right now uh, because for example black lives matter has managed um, to seize a very large part of the public agenda um, not very many people uh, would dare to be racist in across that dimension um, but because there's uh, Kazakh lives matter does not exist, um, that uh, racism or intolerance just shifts to a weaker party. Which one is it? I don't know. I think it's probably a mixture of the two. But I think that there is overall progress. Um, and the reason I think that there's overall progress is because um, each new generation is brought up with more and more knowledge and understanding of the world around them. The only reason why Sasha Baron Cohen manages to make Kazakhstan funny is because of people's total ignorance of Kazakhstan. They don't know where it is. They don't know the first thing about it. And therefore, what the joke is, is this is a fantasy country that you know nothing about. And look at the weird things that go on there. Eventually, you will have generations growing up for whom the idea of an unknown country is, is weird. They will know something about everywhere. And that kind of humor will vanish. I believe in the progress model. I, I am quite positive about that too. And it's amazing to observe it uh, still. The we are still in progress and we need to assess the information and think about uh, how things affect other people, not just us. And um, as you say, understand the cultures and try yeah. to understand uh, yeah, each country and people and just don't assess through the lenses of politics or economics. It's more about the culture itself. Uh, yeah, so as we already talked qu for quite a while and I took a bit of more of your time, I'm sorry. Uh, so yes, so the last question I ask everyone who comes to our podcast is, mm. what is your personal dream for the world and mm. for Lithuania? Um, well, let me deal with the easy one first. My personal dream for Lithuania um, is that um, it should uh, find its place in the international community, not by promoting itself or its own interests, but by making itself useful. Um, and this for me is, the, is the, the true answer to the quest that Lithuania is undertaking. Um, Lithuania, like so many other countries, needs to stop being fixated with brand image and economic growth at the expense of everything else. Um, and it needs to start thinking instead about um, useful mutual engagement with the international community. 
it needs to become uh, more imaginative and more courageous in the way that it interacts with that community. It needs to pursue what I call entrepreneurial multilateralism. Don't just assume that because you are where you are geographically that those are the only countries you can deal with. Don't just assume that the European Union is your universe. There's no rule that says that if Lithuania wants to do something about climate change, they couldn't team up with four countries on four continents, maybe four countries that nobody's ever even heard of before, and do amazing things together. To be brave. Um, and I think that's where um, a lot of happiness comes from. And any, anybody who says, um, so you're saying that the Lithuanian government should only think about the rest of the world and should ignore the needs of its own people, ignore the fact that there's corruption, injustice, inequality, and even poverty within Lithuania. I would say, no, absolutely not. It should never forget those things, but it should fix them at the same time. And that's how you do it. If you work internationally and domestically at the same time, you will fix your problems faster and more imaginatively. To answer the other question, <laughs> what I want for the world, uh, well, it's the same thing. I, I, I would like to see um, a global community, a community of nations um, where uh, countries find the, the, the courage to go to their own populations of governments, go to their own populations and say, look, working in collaboration with other countries um, is to our advantage. It's how we will achieve better outcomes, uh, both for ourselves and for everybody else. Um, as I said before, to change the culture of governance from one that's fundamentally competitive to one that's fundamentally collaborative. That's the way forward. And I'm really interested in the possibilities of, um, of second level powers like Lithuania being able to show the way, because most of the traditional superpowers have completely lost all their credibility. America, for reasons that we know about. The UK, for reasons that we know about. In the end, the kind of countries that people are more and more interested in, and my research shows this all the time, are the countries that have been the victims of colonial power, not the perpetrators of colonial power. The ones that have interesting cultural stories, the smaller and medium sized countries, the countries that, as we said right at the beginning, have a lot to prove. Lithuania is one of those countries. And never think that just because you're relatively small, or relatively less powerful militarily or economically, it means you can't have a gigantic impact on the human community because you can. It's precisely these countries that can have the most influence in the coming years. Very inspiring and um, especially interesting because now Lithuania is working on um, its uh, strategy for mm -hmm. how to show itself in the world and I hope uh, we will reach the decision makers and they will listen to this message and take it thoroughly. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much Simon for coming today to our podcast. It was a pleasure Rita, thank you very much.